Rajneesh is one of India's most controversial gurus. People surrender their worldly goods, their money, all that they had. And that wealth was then used to buy a fleet of cars, Rolls Royces. And deemed to be the largest such collection in the world. It's the fact that you own so many or have so many Rolls Royces. Why do you need 90? I don't need even a single one. And they don't belong to me either. But my people want. They want 365, one for every day. And I go for a drive only for one hour. Rajneesh would come out twice a day in one of his 96 Rolls Royces and literally be worshipped by his thousands of Western devotees. Donning orange garb and attending the ashram of a celebrated guru in Pune in the lovely hills above Bombay. I adopted this sannyas mode in order to help make a documentary film for the BBC. My mandate was to absorb as much as I could. The guru in question was named Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh. Bhagwan simply means God or Godly, and Sri means Holy. He was a man with huge soulful eyes and a bewitching smile, and a natural if somewhat dirty sense of humor. His sibilant voice, usually deployed through a low-volume microphone at early morning darshan, possessed a faintly hypnotic quality. This was of some use in alleviating the equally hypnotic platitudinousness of his discourses. There was more emphasis on love in its eternal sense, and certainly there was more emphasis on sex. Master and disciple, something happens in your heart when you see a master. Bhagwan is my master, and I love him. <laughs> Bhagwan's my master. So they surrendered all that they had, and that wealth became the guru's wealth. And the people who followed him simply had nothing. They had basic food, nonsensical beliefs. Signed at the entrance to the Bhagwan's preaching tent. This little sign never failed to irritate me. It read, Shoes and minds must be left at the gate. There was a pile of shoes and saddles next to it, and in my transcendent condition I could almost picture a heap of abandoned and empty mentalities to round out this literally mindless little motto. I even attempted a brief parody of a Zen koan. What is the reflection of a mind discarded? Part of his required allegiance demanded that his followers always wear orange, India's holy color, and a portrait of their master around their necks. Don't you tell them to give their money for something else other than for a Rolls Royce? All other religions are doing that. Let them do that, their work. Let me do my work. All other religions are looking after the poor. At least leave me alone to look after the rich. But within its holy precincts, as I soon discovered, there was a more sinister principle at work. Many damaged and distraught personalities came to Pune, seeking advice and counsel. Trigger emotional and mental diseases, which have been known to place people even in insane asylums for the rest of their lives. Several of them were well off. The clients or pilgrims included a distant member of the British royal family, and were at first urged, as with so many faiths, to part with all their material possessions. Leave me alone to look after the rich. After this relatively brisk fleecing, initiates were transferred into group sessions where the really nasty business began. Wolfgang Dobrovolny's film Ashram, shot in secret by a former devotee and adapted for my documentary, shows the playful term Kundalini in a fresh light. In a representative scene, a young woman is stripped naked and surrounded by men who bark at her, drawing attention to all her physical and psychic shortcomings, until she's abject with tears and apologies. At this point, she is hugged and embraced and comforted and told that she now has a family. Sobbing with masochistic relief, she humbly enters the tribe. It was not absolutely clear what she had to do in order to be given her clothes back, but I did hear some believable and ugly testimony on this point. In other sessions involving men, things were rough enough for bones to be broken and lives lost. The German princeling of the House of Windsor was never seen again, and his body was briskly cremated without the tedium of an autopsy. Cathartic breathing, and the reason for it is just to move your energy and to get you out of your head and into your body. The next phase, the screaming phase of dynamic meditation, feels like when you finally had an opportunity to throw a tantrum when you were a little kid. By the time you get to the third phase of jumping up and down and yelling who, you're hardly there at all. Your gut is yelling who, and you're not doing it anymore. You become one with this whole energy. Broken down mentally and emotionally, and they thought it was okay because Oh, it gets them over their ego, so they'll be free within the belief. What happened to the Rolls-Royce collection, I never found out. But his acolytes received 
some kind of message to reconvene in the small town of Antelope, Oregon in the early months of 1983, and this they did, though now less committed to the Pacific and laid-back style. The local inhabitants were disconcerted to find an armed compound being erected in their neighborhood with unsmiling Orange Guard security forces. An attempt to create space for the new ashram was apparently made. In a bizarre episode, food poisoning matter was found to have been spread over the produce in an antelope supermarket. Eventually, the commune broke up and dispersed amid serial recriminations, and I have occasionally run into empty-eyed refugees from the Bagwan's long and misleading tuition. I would say that the people of Antelope, Oregon, missed being as famous as Jonestown by a fairly narrow margin.